Joe, many of us have been fascinated about the mind-body problem our whole life. What's the nature of human consciousness? And uh, it used to be the domain of philosophers that this was their area. Some theologians would weigh in. And uh, in uh, certainly beginning in the 20th century and more recent uh, decades especially, uh, brain scientists who are now putting their hands in electrodes and, and chemicals uh, right on the core of consciousness have been weighing in with, with their opinions. Uh, how do you reflect on consciousness after your research? Well, I guess I had the, the fortune of, um, as a graduate student, being thrown into the consciousness game because I was studying split brain patients where you can't escape the consciousness question. And so I kind of got that out of my system <laughs> very early and uh, <laughs> don't have to go back to it when I get older the way it usually <laughs> works in, in brain science. <laughs> um, and you know, I did really develop a, a strong appreciation for it, and there wasn't much work going on in brain science about consciousness right. at that time. Um, but I also saw the difficulties of it and saw it as an impediment to research uh, if, if one were to take that uh, as, a, as an approach for a career. And I decided very early on to uh, try to figure out a way to study emotions without getting hung up on the problem of consciousness. And so that's led me to the idea today, which is that, um, you know, many people think that consciousness is the big unanswered question, but I really think that that's not the big unanswered question. The big question is how our brain makes us who we are. And there's so much of who we are that's unconscious or below the surface of, of consciousness mm -hmm. that that's really what we need to understand. And we need to come to terms with the way the brain is working, not, in, not as linear systems of perception and memory and emotion, but as integrated systems that links all of those things together. Because as a person, you are not just you know, what you see and think and feel and hear, but the integration of all of those things. You know, the, it's, it's a cliche, but the whole of your uh, brain is greater than the sum of its parts. And we haven't figured out how to study that whole. We don't have a brain theory. We have, we've been very good in neuroscience at studying individual systems, but not studying the whole brain as a, as a unit. What are some examples of the individual systems that have been studied that can reflect on this uh, sense of the, of the person, of the individual, as opposed to just that element of consciousness? I don't, I don't think we have any. Uh, I, mean, I guess emotions would be the closest thing because... Um, you know, when emotion, there are two things about emotions that are important. One is that they monopolize your brain resources. Mm -hmm. So when you're in an emotional state, nothing, the brain can't do anything else. It's monopolized because, um, uh, for example, if you're in the, faced with a predator, you have to use everything you've got to stay alive. Nothing else matters. Your digestion is postponed, you know, it's, it's put on hold, blood is taken from the gut, put into the brain, and uh, it's taken from the skin because if you get wounded, uh, you might bleed to death. I mean, that's where it's taken from. But why it's taken is your brain needs the energy. Your muscles need the energy. You know, it's the fight-flight response. And so emotions just take over the whole body. So the second thing about emotions are that they're contagious. So if I'm acting fearful and anxious and afraid, that's going to make you fearful, anxious, and afraid if you're next to me. And that's why... You know, the political use of fear is so effective because once you make one person scared, everybody else around them will be scared as well. Then you have this kind of mass behavior of fear. Um, so emotions are an interesting topic to, from, you know, an interesting perspective from which to study consciousness. And they haven't been used as, as uh, much as they, they might be. A lot of work on consciousness in neuroscience today uh, rightly so, starts from the simpler point of view of, you know, how do we become conscious of a sensory stimulus? So there's a lot of work in the visual system that's been very impressive in terms of beginning to understand perceptual awareness. So, I mean, the goal would be to understand not just how the brain processes the redness of a sunset, but how the brain experiences the redness of a sunset. And that's uh, been a revolution in brain science because, um, you know, the behaviorists got rid of consciousness. Mm -hmm. The cognitive scientists brought, co co brought the mind back to psychology and, and brain science, but it didn't bring the conscious mind back. It brought the information processing mind back. So it, through information processing, again, we study the redness of the sunset, but not, then we study how the brain processes the redness of the sunset, but not how it experiences it. So the consciousness revolution is to try and understand how the experience of the sunset comes about. 
So can you begin to uh, get some data about that experience from an emotional analysis of that? How would you do uh, of that? Of a rat? Uh, 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 of anything. Um, I think you could do it in humans. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging. I mean, you depend on self-report, which yeah. is always the, the bugaboo of, sure. of consciousness research, that if you're relying on people and their self-reports, they're not necessarily accurate uh, about what it is that's going on in their minds. Mm. So uh, as you've reflected back now uh, on your career and looking at the progress consciousness has made and, and your own research and emotions, um, uh, can, can you project forward uh, 20 years, 50, 100 years, uh, where do you think uh, brain science can be in understanding ultimately what consciousness is? I'd like to project uh, maybe 100,000 years instead. Okay, because, that's good. Um, I think it's not really a scientific answer, but it's kind of a hope for mankind, which is that right now our prefrontal cortex uh, has no communication with the amygdala. So the part of the cortex, prefrontal cortex, that's involved in thinking, planning, decision making, mm -hmm. is not connected with the amygdala. That's why it's so hard for us to have uh, conscious control over a thought or a, a conscious control over an emotion like fear or anxiety. We can't say, okay, I'm not gonna be anxious. I'm not gonna be depressed anymore because there's no connectivity there. <laughs> On the other hand, our emotions have strong connectivity with the entire cortex. The amygdala has strong connectivity with the entire cortex. That's why it's easy for emotions to monopolize and dominate our thoughts. So the idea that I would think in an optimistic human uh, future <laughs> would be that our emotions and cognitions would be better integrated. I won't say that our cognitions will dominate our emotions, because then we'd be like Mr. Spock, and that's not what we want. What we want is a brain that can harmoniously use and integrate thoughts and emotions in a, a kind of holistic and, um, as I said, integrated way, rather than one dominating over the other. And if we had that, then we'd have a world where we weren't competing and fighting and killing each other, but instead living together more harmoniously. The challenge would be in an evolutionary paradigm, though, is to have those kinds of brains be selected for, and it's not, it's not, it's not quite clear that they would be the survivors. That's right. I'm an optimist. <laughs>